it's about time to get political. What do you think? Yeah, to talk about our rights, to talk about the Constitution and all that stuff. What do you think? Is it, is it time for the main event? Is it time for the main event? I'll tell you this, my friends. I really got to start off by saying thank you to Clark for opening up this space and his home. Thank you. Thank you to Mark for organizing this. And I really want to lift up the fact that tonight what we're doing is actually doing political work that actually starts with an understanding of the need for culture, for art. Because frankly, my friends, if it does not actually have an artistic cultural expression, it's just words. Right? So I really want to honor what we're doing here and how we're doing it. And it is really a privilege for me to be standing before you. And so I think that what I'm going to do, instead of my normal lecture, which I often do at law schools, which I do in universities, I'm going to tell a story. Right? I'm just going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that large transnational corporations are not just exercising power. I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that these large transnational corporations are ruling us. As surely as masters once ruled slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling over us because they're making the decisions for us. Corporate CEOs have already decided how much poison will be in the water that you're drinking. Corporate CEOs have already decided how much poison will be in the air that you're breathing right now. Corporate CEOs are deciding whether you get health care. doesn't matter if you're sick. doesn't matter if you're injured. It matters if they decide that you've got enough money to actually get access to that health care. That's the world we live in. So I am going to tell a story, but as every good storyteller, I'm actually going to try to actually weave it and touch down for us and help us to understand the social, political, and economic institutions that we're living in. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Nina Sharpie. All right. As a storyteller, my friends, I'm going to be transparent. We're going to cover four topics in this story. Democracy. Sovereignty, legal personhood, and lastly, the corporation. Aha! Democracy, that word gets tossed around a lot in this country. Let's make sure we've got some common agreement. From what language does the word democracy derive? Greek. Greek, very good, let's break it down. Demos means... Dima, demos means the people. Kratcha means rule. So literally, literally the word democracy translated from the Attic Greek means the people rule. Pop quiz. How many of y'all believe we the people are ruling in the United States? Don't be shy. Look around. Not a single hand in the air. Nobody ever answers that question. That is a problem. But saying it another way, friends, I will tell you this. That's a good thing. No, it's not a good thing that we the people don't rule. It's a good thing that we're living in a generation, we're living in a moment in American history where finally we're actually telling the truth, notwithstanding the creation myth in this country, notwithstanding the lies that we were told as children. We don't live in a functioning democracy in the United States. We're supposed to, but we don't. The point is we can, but we don't. So... We don't have a functioning democracy. That brings me to the next topic, which is sovereignty. Friends, if I just had the word, if I just had the word the sovereign up there, who or what would you think of? Quick, the sovereign. King. I bet everybody here thought king, right? That's because the word sovereignty means the authority to rule. And 500 years ago, my friend, the king was the sovereign. The sovereign was the king. Those words were literally synonymous. And where did the king claim his authority to rule? God! Yeah. You do not get more legitimate. <laughs> 500 years ago, people just like you and you and you and me not only said it, but we believed it. Friends, I'm asking you to take a moment to recognize the question of sovereignty, not just who has the authority to rule, but deeper, what is the legitimate authority to make and implement decisions for a society? That's probably the most important question that any group of human beings ask for themselves. And you know what? A series of crises that are coming down upon us 
right now. And I say that not to freak you out, but I say it so you'll get serious with me because I'm serious. I take myself seriously. I take you seriously for being here. But I also want to remind you that in the Chinese language, where they use symbols for words, the symbol for crisis is also the symbol for another word. Opportunity. 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 Yeah. Friends, we live in a moment of opportunity that few human beings have ever faced. The opportunity to actually recreate our entire society that could actually be based on peace and justice and ecological sustainability. And I'm going to say it, love. I'm going to say it, love. We could actually create an economic and political system that is based on love. And how come not enough politicians talk about love? I'd like to know. Because isn't that what really motivates and drives us? Isn't that what we really want? Because here's another thing. They, the ruling elite, lie to us constantly. They say that people are lazy and they don't want to work. That's a lie. People want meaningful, productive work for which they will be acknowledged. That's what people want. Now, people don't want a job where you get shit on and pushed around. But it, they do want to actually engage in meaningful, productive activity. And people actually want a different world than the one we're living in. Polling data shows it. And you know what, folks? Your own lived experience shows it. You know you don't want to be living in this society. Talk to anybody. I don't care whether they're a Republican, a Libertarian, a Green, a Democrat. Uh, uh, I, to hell with them all. I won't vote for anybody. Ask anybody. Nobody actually wants to be living in the society that we're living in now. we got a problem, friends, and that's going to bring me actually to this next topic, which is legal personhood. Please note that I did not write corporate personhood on the board. <laughs> right? That's because the concept of legal personhood means simply the ability to assert rights. Right. Right. Now, this is important. See, if you're a legal person under our legal system, it means that you can assert rights under law and they'll be acknowledged. See, legal personhood is not merely a technicality that only lawyers should be concerned about. See, if you're a legal person, you can assert rights under law. Think of it this way. The entire history of the United States and every social movement that, you're, uh, that we know about today at its core was about power and ruling and about the ability for some group of human beings to actually claim to be persons with rights. This matters. It matters a great deal. And the last word on the board is the word corporation. What language is that from, friends? Latin. Latin. It's Latin. Corpus means body. And the suffix T-I-O-N means to have or create. So literally, the word corporation just means to have or create body. And that's because in law school we are taught... By the way, any lawyers in the crowd besides me that would admit it? <laughs> it's a friendly crowd. Okay, I'll just tell you, in law school, in law school, we are taught, we are taught that a corporation is a legal fiction. In fact, even though you weren't subjected to three years of law school to pervert your thought process, if you've heard the phrase, even if you don't know precisely what it means legally, but if you've just heard that a corporation is legal fiction, raise your hand for a moment, please. Look at that. All these hands go up, right? Corporation legal fiction. Corporation legal fiction. A corporation is legal fiction. A corporation is a legal fiction. Friends, if a corporation is a legal fiction, that begs the question, what does the word fiction mean? <laughs> Something that's made up. Not true. We are taught in law school, my first year corporations class, class, the professor stood before us and said, you have to understand a corporation doesn't exist in the physical material world. You know, reality. <laughs> a corporation doesn't actually exist that way, but we are taught you have to pretend like this group of people, but more importantly, the material and the resources and the contractual obligations they make, a very complex construct, we will pretend like it's just one thing so that we can treat it a certain way under law. And friends, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it is true. It is true. It, is true. it becomes true. And here is the thing. We have to understand that a corporation is a construct because collectively, socially, we give it power, we give it meaning. This is a really important point. I'm not just getting metaphysical on your ass. I'm telling you, <laughs> this is a super important concept to understand in terms of economics. This most dominant institution on planet Earth only exists because enough of us collectively have said that it does. But I'm going to go even further and tell you that the corporation was first created in 
it, the reason that it comes from Latin is because the first corporations were created in Rome during the Roman Republic. Not, by the way, during the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we'd spend a little more time asking, what does happen when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States. Just saying. Or, as the great Texas comedian Bill Hicks would say, I'm just planting seeds. I'm just planting seeds for a later conversation, right? Imperialism might be an important conversation. But, here's the thing. The Romans created this concept, this construct known as a corporation for a reason. For example, how many people here tonight have ever said or heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Oh, yeah. right? All the hands go up, right? It's 2,000 years later, we still say that, right? Guess what? That elaborate road system was built and operated as a corporation. Likewise, the aqueduct system, this amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula without electricity. Quick little parenthetical to say, one of the reasons I continue to be so hopeful and optimistic is because I know how clever human beings are. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. They were moving water all across the Italian peninsula. They didn't even have technology. They didn't even have electricity. And I'm going to tell you something, my friends. I don't think you could name a problem that I can't give you the solution to if you give me about 20 minutes and access to the internet. <laughs> now, I need that internet access because I'm not telling you I've got the solution because I don't. But I'll tell you this, with an internet access and 20 minutes, I'll find somebody who solved that problem for you. Correction. I'll find a group of people working collectively and cooperatively together who have figured out the solution to the problem. Because that's where the genius of humanity exists, is when we work collaboratively and cooperatively Woo! together, right? You're Woo! feeling it. So here's the thing. That aqueduct system, it was created, designed, and operated as a corporation. Likewise, the first universities, the first hospitals, can y'all guess? Corporation, corporation. So a pop quiz, what does a road system, a water system, a university, a hospital, what do they all have in common? All owned by people. They're all owned by people. What's the purpose of them? No, public good. Everything I just described was for the public good. The original conception of the corporation was to provide a mechanism to take private money, resources, and material and put it to some sort of public use. That's really important, right? And by the way, I think it's really rec important to recognize that that may have been the original conception of the corporation. And having said that, let's be clear that David Cobb and the Move to Men Coalition are not anti-corporation. Here's the thing, y'all. What we have to understand that is that a corporation is merely an instrument. It's merely a tool. The question is what is being done with these tools? Because very important, powerful things can be done to facilitate the work that needs to be done. So the question is not, is a corporation good or bad? The question is, what is the political, economic system in which that hammer or that tool is being operated, right? So let's take a moment and be just as courageous as we were about the fact that we don't live in a functioning democracy, and notwithstanding the lies that we were told in our history textbooks about the age of discovery, the 13th and 14th century of Europe wasn't the age of discovery at all. It was the age of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. There's one word that sums that up for me. We've talked about it already. It's called empire. That's what imperialism means, see? It's beating people down. It's stealing from them. It's killing them. And then creating a, a, a legal system to legalize it, right? I mean, that's what's really deep here, right? Is to take these absolutely anti-human ideas and somehow legitimize them. So here's the thing, and this is important. Stay with me. The modern transnational corporation didn't just sort of accidentally get created during the age of empire. The modern transnational corporation, as we understood it and understand it today, was created as an intentional, deliberate instrument of empire. In fact, one of the most famous of those early corporations, they were called joint stock companies. The most famous, perhaps, of the joint stock companies was called the East India Company. 
Oh, I see some of you have heard of it. The East India Company, literally designed to militarily conquer the entire subcontinent of India. And not only that, not only to militarily conquer them, but to beat those people down, to destroy the existing civilization and institutions that they had created to get their own needs met, and to force them to work and labor to steal the resources from their own land so that their wealth could be transferred to the wealthy shareholders of the East India Company. It was a business model based on imperialism. That's what it means. Another Let me say this, that the Africa Trading Company did not trade slaves. The Africa Trading Company traded human beings. Human beings, and now I'm going to go deep with y'all, the Africa Trading Company traded human beings who were basically just like me. Now, I say that with some trepidation because I know what pigment I have. I'm not stupid. But I say it with conviction. Because if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, she or he will tell you race does not exist. Yeah, pigment exists, but so does haircut well, for those of you who have hair. But eye color exists, right? I mean, there are trivial differences between homo sapiens and human beings, but no scientist or biologist would ever elevate pigment to a classification or a taxonomy. So with certainty, I tell you, race does not exist. But stay with me, because racism damn sure does. What? Well, how can that be? Oh, yes, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it becomes true. My friends, I, what I'm pointing out here is this is super important, and that is that race is a construct as surely as the corporation is a construct, and race got created in order to legitimize and justify the oppressive idea of enslaving other human beings. And now I'm going to get really deep and tell, yeah, right? Thank you, Jaime. And I'm going to go really deep and tell you, actually race got created not just to justify the enslavement of Africans, mostly race got created to confuse and bamboozle people who look like me. White people are the most confused whenever it comes to race because it goes something like this. I may be poor, I may be from Appalachia, I may be working class, and I understand that the boss man's boot is on my neck. I hate this. At least I'm white. I'm telling you, friends, it is super important for white people to actually spend a little bit of time understanding what whiteness is, what white supremacy means, and how for most of us who happen to have this pigment, actually the real people who are benefiting from this are the 1%. Yeah, they might mo mostly yeah. look like my pigment, but they're not of my class. They're not my people. We're all poor. <laughs> right? <laughs> so all I'm getting at is we need to go deep. And now I'm going to go into the last segment of this little history lesson. Y'all liking this story so far? Yeah. Cool, cool. Because now where we're going is the American creation myth, right? Because here's the thing. It is a creation myth, but you know why the ruling elite tell that creation myth? Because it works. See, they tell us this story of America and liberty and justice and equality because that's what you want. Yeah. See, and not just like that's the story you want. You want, you deserve to live in liberty, justice, and equality. That is the human desire, right? So there's a reason that we actually understand this. But I'm going to go now directly to the source, if you will. The, in this country, there is a supreme law of the land. One document that is supposed to be how we operate our government. What is that document called? The U.S. Constitution. Constitution. Pop quiz, how many of y'all have actually read this document? Matters. If you ever want to understand how something works, you have to see it as a system, and more importantly, see it as a system that is relating to other systems. You know, that's actually how reality really works. So if you want to understand the Constitution, read it in its entirety, and I will suggest you'll see two principal actors. The first actor is the most important actor. In fact, it's so important, it's the first three words. We the people. We the people. Those are hallowed words in this country, and they should be. See, we the people come together to create the second actor, which is government itself. Let me stop for a moment and say, understand that in this framework that we're laying out, we the people create government. 
the government is dependent upon us. In fact, many of my friends like to say that the people should never be afraid of government. In fact, they say government should be afraid of the people. Pop quiz. How many of y'all believe the government is afraid of we the people? I do. I see. I do. Right? Right? And, hey, like, like, like somebody else, like, like, like Dylan said, wait for it. Wait for it, because actually, if you think about it for just one moment, you'll realize the government is afraid of us. What do you think all that spying is about? Yes. Yes. That's true. Now I'm going to go even deeper and tell you, all you have to do is look at the Occupy movement and that phenomenon. Yep. Because I'll tell you something, friends, I had the privilege of traveling around the country. I rolled up on about 40 or 50 Occupy encampments during the heyday of Occupy, and I offered this teach-in, humbly and with humility, right? And everywhere I went, I saw the same thing. You know what I saw? Ordinary people talking to each other. I saw ordinary people having conversation about why is it that we live in a society that we don't want and not that none of the systems that we're told that we use to make changes are actually effective. You see, the government was scared witless, and I'm going to say it shitless. They were scared because ordinary Americans were telling the truth to one another and asking those kind of questions. Now, it's even worse than that because all you have to do is look at the Freedom of Information Act results that have been filed. These are public information, and you will see that the Obama administration worked hand in glove with the Department of Homeland Security, police departments in every major city, especially and including Los Angeles, and facilitated the intentional disruption of those Occupy encampments because they were afraid. And they were afraid of ordinary people coming together and having conversation. And you know what, friends? I wish that I could sometimes have an opportunity to talk to some of the real ruling elite in this country who are so afraid of ordinary people. Because you know what I'd like to tell them? Don't be afraid. There's nothing... Like, actually, we're a peaceful, loving movement. That's right. And you know what? Actually, you may not like what we're doing but your grandchildren are going to be grateful that we staged an intervention on your ass. Right? Because these ruling elite, they are addicted. They are addicted to power and domination as surely as any crack addict is addicted, right? They're just getting, they're ate up with the greed disease so much. And here's the thing. If I ever got the chance to actually talk to one of these ruling elite and actually engage with them, I'd actually like to say, hey, come outside. Let me take you for a walk into a forest or a meadow or along the beach and actually get you reconnected to what a beautiful planet you're part of and how you're actually connected to everything else. Because actually, my friends, this is a wonderful place. And there is a place for all of us there, right? And i got to tell you something. Those people, the ruling elite, the ones who are really in charge, they actually think that they're doing good. Like, they, they really believe that because, like, they think they're so important. I mean, as they're looking in the mirror shaving, and most of them are shaving, by the way. It's just, right? Men, let's just acknowledge that, too. We gotta, white people got to acknowledge whiteness. Men got to acknowledge patriarchy. All I'm saying is, as they're shaving, they're looking in the mirror and say, I am so damned important. You know, I, the world needs me to keep everything going like this. And let me tell you what. That is a delusion. That's like a mental illness. Frankly, friends, if we lived in a just and compassionate society, we'd get them help. <laughs> instead, wow. instead, we put them in charge. That's, that's our fault. That's our problem. That's kind of the point of Move to Amend is the idea that we need to build this movement that actually makes independent power possible. But I want to go back to my little story. We the people create government. And in this constitutional framework, in the constitutional framework, we the people are described and understood to be free and sovereign. And what does the word sovereign mean again? The ability to rule. We the people claim the ability to rule. Government doesn't rule over us. Government isn't sovereign. In fact, government is supposed to be subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. Government is accountable to whom? The people. That's got a ring to it, doesn't it? I like how this is going. Let's continue. We the people are free and sovereign because we the people have rights. 
Government does not have rights. Government only has duties. I'm going to stop for a moment as a lawyer and really lift this up because it's important. See, if I have the right to do something, that means I can do it. And I don't need anybody's permission. I don't need your permission. I don't need the city council's permission. I don't need the state of California's permission. I don't need the federal government's permission. Man, I'm from Texas. I don't need my mama's permission. <laughs> Legally. <laughs> Culturally, however, I mean, because in Texas, some of y'all I've heard in California say what all Texans say. If mama ain't happy, nobody, nobody happy. Because <laughs> here's the thing. That is our culture. That is my culture. And I think it's important to recognize that we are taught that our culture is supposed to be based and premised upon love and compassion and sharing, that those are the public virtues. How is it that we have political and, more importantly, economic institutions that don't reflect those cultural values, right? This is part of our problem. But I want to get back to this. If I have the right to do something, it means I can do it. And no government can legitimately infringe upon my rights. This is important, right? Rights are profound. And the Constitution doesn't create rights. The Constitution recognizes rights, rights that are inherent and inalienable. We have those rights because we're human beings. In fact, my friends, we have those rights, and don't get alarmed, it's just going to be one button. For those in the back who can't see it, and those watching at home, I'm pointing to my belly button. So if you're too embarrassed or shy to check here in this public place, go home tonight. Make sure you have one. Because if you do, you also have human rights that are inherent and unalienable and government cannot infringe upon them. See how important those are? Human rights belong to you if you have a belly button. Doesn't matter what country you are from. Doesn't matter how you got here, right? Human beings have rights. Feeling it? I thought so. So here's the thing. Government does not have rights over the people. Government only has duties. Duties are responsibilities. And where do those duties come from? Well, remember, all power resides with the people. In fact, the founders of this country are famous for having said no government can even be legitimate if it does not have the consent of the governed that they are exercising power. So all power resides with the people. But the point is, yes, the people hold all the political power, but in our framework and our system of government, we the people delegate a certain amount of our power. Do we delegate all our power to government? No. no. We only delegate enough power to government to perform the duties that we have told them to do. And how does government discharge those duties? They write laws in the public interest. And I'm going to stop for a moment and tell you whether you agree or disagree with any public law, the political process that makes those laws is what is supposed to be a legitimate public opinion. I'm going to pledge to you, even if I disagree with you, I will treat you respectfully, and I challenge you to do that, not just with me, but with everybody else you come into contact with. Let's commit ourselves to actually being able to engage in fierce debate and struggle and struggle together, but be respectful. Because even, even idiots have a right to their opinion. <laughs> the one thing that no public law can ever do is to violate the private rights of a person who lives there. Remember? That's what, that's what constitutional right means. The, the government cannot violate your rights. No, even if a law went through a political process, Jim Crow segregation laws were illegitimate under this framework, even though it went through a political democratic process. This is super important. And now that I've taken the time to lay all this out in one sentence, I'm going to describe to you how our system of government is supposed to operate. Now, it's a run-on sentence, but it's still just one <laughs> sentence. Watch this. In the U.S. Constitution, we the people are free and sovereign because we the people have all the power. But we delegate a certain amount of our power to government. Government which will always be subordinate and accountable to the will of the people. And we charge government to, with certain duties to write laws in the public interest. Local, state, and federal laws. It's their duty to write. But the one thing that no public law can ever do is to violate the private rights of the free and sovereign people who live there. Ta-da! Yeah. I mean, isn't that brilliant? Isn't this beautiful? We have our 
civil liberties are supposed to be protected, but we have a communitarian process by which public laws are made, but no public law can violate private rights. This is brilliant. This is beautiful. We should try that in this country. Yeah. This would totally work. And I'm not joking. This is brilliant. And I'm also not joking that we've never, ever tried it. There is not some democracy to return to because we've never actually had one. Yeah. And by that legal personhood means the ability to assert rights. Who gets to be a legal person in 1789 in this country? Women. What? Ah, oh, white. Is it all the white people? Oh, only the white men. Is it all the white men? No, no only the rich, wealthy uh, white men. Actually, only the rich, wealthy white men who were in the right religion, because religion mattered too. Ah. You know what percentage of the adult human beings living in the United States in 1789, when this beautiful document is actually ratified, what percentage were actually people who could assert rights? One percent. <laughs> Look, the one the percent meme is really pretty good. I like that. And actually, it's not just one percent. It's really more like point zero 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 two percent that are really like running the show. Five percent of the adult human beings living here could actually claim to be legal persons with rights. In fact, I like how the late great Howard Zinn said it. The entire history of the United States can be seen and understood as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be defined as persons with rights under our Constitution. Because let's be even clear, right? The reality is for all this beautiful rhetoric, and this is beautiful rhetoric, again, this, the reason they use this creation myth is because it works, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. In its implementation, this document allowed, encouraged, and facilitated the intentional, deliberate genocide of the human beings who were already living here. This document facilitated and allowed the enslavement of Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun, at the point of a spear, and forced to build this country with slave labor. This document codified and allowed the systematic oppression of women. This document codified, allowed, facilitated the exploitation and oppression of most people who had my pigment, who had my genitalia, who weren't rich. Right? We have to actually come to terms. And the things that changed around this document, the words stayed the same. You know what changed? Culture changed because social movements, because people like me and you started having conversations like this and said, we've got the power to make change. Well, before I put it up there, I want to ask this honest question. Somebody tell me what it takes to form a corporation in California today. $30. $30 is the application fee, and as long as you fill the form out correctly, as long as you dot the I's and cross your T's, do you know what the Secretary of State will do? They will rubber stamp that docu document and issue you what? A corporate charter. Do you know how long your corporate charter can last? Forever. Forever. You know what you can do with a corporate charter under California law today? Anything that is legally permissible. That's what the code says. Apparently, if you have enough wealth and power, you can do a whole lot of illegal things. But the point I'm making is that this institution known as the corporation, we don't even think about it. We haven't been taught to think about it. We haven't been taught to think about where the hell did it come from. History matters, right? And now I want to take you back to 1789 and tell you what it once took to form a corporation in every single one of those newly created states. And this was true for about 100 years in this country. First, your application didn't go to some trivial clerk. Your application went directly to the State House of Representatives where they discussed it, debated it, and voted on it, and you had to get a majority vote. But that's not enough because now if you got that majority vote in the House of Representatives, your application went to the State Senate where they discussed it, debated it, and voted on it, and you had to get them another majority vote. But that's still not enough because now your application goes to the governor who considers it and has to be willing to sign it. Does that sound anything like a corporate charge? today? No, sir. Of course not. What did I just describe? A law. a law. I want you to take a moment to recognize that the chartering process that our founders, you know how some of these, some Americans are like so, they got founder fetishism and they want to know what the founders are all about. Well, the founders said corporate chartering was a privilege that would require a political act, the same equivalent of writing and passing a law. And get this, if you were given the privilege of incorporation, 
all you could do was the specific thing that you had asked to do. And if you did any other type of business or did anything else with that corporate charter, you know what happened to it? It was revoked. Corporate charters were routinely revoked for going ultra virus. In Latin, it means beyond the authority of why it had been allowed to be created. And I'm still not through because if you were granted a corporate charter, it was only good for usually five, 10, at most 20 years. You know, a human, what was a, considered a working human being's lifespan, that's as long as any corporate charter could ever last. And at the end of that, pro that chartering time, do you know what happened to the corporate charter and limited liability? It evaporated. The business could continue, but the privilege of limited liability was over because it was a political decision that had been made. Oh, and now, let me give you the, as Bugs Bunny would say, the coupe de grassi coming up. <laughs> because even if you were operating in the narrow time period of the corporate charter, even if you were doing the specific thing for which you had been granted the corporate charter, if you ever did anything to violate the public interest yes. or the public trust, do you know what happened to that corporate charter? Dissolved. Revoked. Dissolved. The corporate charters were once routinely revoked for merely acting outside the public interest. That brings me to another pop quiz. You see I like to do pop quizzes. Here's a pop quiz question. Somebody name a single one of the Fortune 500 corporations <laughs> that could even exist today with the political restrictions that once existed for a hundred years created by the founders in this country. I'll wait. Trick question, trick question. <laughs> trick question, trick question. Okay, there's not a single one of them. Now, I want to be clear, there are thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of corporations that could still operate. I'm not against corporations writ large, but let's just be clear, these huge transnational corporations are actually instruments of empire, so we shouldn't be surprised what these huge mega corporations do. But let's not be against commerce, let's not be against helping to facilitate like productive work being done. But here's the thing, my friends, right on. Here's the thing, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not saying that 1789 was the land of milk and honey. Oh no, because slavery existed. There was systemic racism. We know that women were being systematically oppressed. We know that the class system was being used. What I'm saying is that instrument known as the corporation was politically appropriately controlled. So I'm not saying let's go back to some grand old day about how great this country once was, but let's acknowledge that the founders understood that the corporation as an instrument created by the state process through a charter was supposed to be, and in fact is, politically controlled. And now that we know that it takes an action of state government to create the corporate charter, we understand and know that the corporate charter can be used to hold the corporation subordinate and accountable. We understand that the corporate charter can be used to describe the duties of what a corporation either can or cannot do. And we know that a corporation should only be allowed to exist through this political process if it serves the public interest. Isn't it just painfully obvious that a corporation must be here? And now, my friends, thank you for your patience, because here comes the real punchline. When the United States Supreme Court, in an act of supreme judicial activism, by the way, for those who concern themselves with judicial restraint, when the Supreme Court says, notwithstanding law, notwithstanding history, notwithstanding common damn sense, we're going to tell you that you, in this society, have to now treat a corporation as if it's a person with rights. It perverts the whole thing. So there's that. But I want you to be stay with me here. Because corporate personhood is just a shorthand phrase to describe an important philosophical concept. Corporate personhood means that a corporation can claim the inherent unalienable rights that only human beings are supposed to have. And if a corporation can claim constitutional rights, that means that a corporate lawyer can waltz into court and overturn any democratically enacted laws. It means that corporate lawyers can overturn worker protection laws because it violates a corporation's constitutional rights. It means a corporate lawyer can overturn environmental protection laws. It means that they can overturn public health and public safety laws. And as many of you now know, that they can overturn campaign finance laws. We're not even allowed to try to protect the integrity of our election process anymore. Well, I say, ya basta, enough already. This is crazy. 
This doesn't make any sense. And that's why I stand before you, my colleague and comrade Margaret Coster, who's going to stand up, stand before you as representatives of Move to Amend. We are a, not nonpartisan, we are a transpartisan group. We've got Democrats and Republicans and Libertarians and Greens and Communists and Socialists all coming together to say we need a constitutional amendment that says we the people are free and sovereign, that we have rights but corporations do not. And I'm going to go further with you. We're going to open it up for discussion. I see your hand, but I want to be clear. We believe that the Constitution must be amended to abolish in its entirety the idea that any artificial entity has inherent unalienable rights and that money is not speech. But let's be clear, that's not enough. That's the beginning, not the end. Because really what we need is a democracy movement in the United States of America. Yeah. Right? We've got to actually learn some humility in this country and look to our sisters and brothers in the global south who are actually showing us the way about what real change looks like. And if you are not yet part of the Move to Men coalition, if you've been moved by the idea that we can have nonviolent revolution in this country, sign up with us. We didn't even exist before 2010, and without a single story in corporate media, we just clicked over 294,000 people. If we want the systemic transformational change that we need, all we have to do is look at U.S. history, and there is actually a very simple formula to do it. Now, it's a hard formula to implement, but the formula is easy. It's a two-step process. First, we must build a social movement that is broad and deep and educated and militant. Broad meaning it cuts across sectors, across divisions across ideas. It must be deep because it must go into where we live, work, and play. we got to feel it in our bones and actually be committed to it. It must be educated so that we can understand not only our history, but understand the political moment that we live in. Read late-stage corporate capitalism and what that means. But lastly, it must be militant, which doesn't mean it has to be violent. I'm a nonviolent revolutionary, man. I'm a revolutionary, but I am committed to nonviolence, right? Militant does not mean violent. Now, by the way, I'm not a pacifist. I'm nonviolent. If you don't think that I'm, uh, if you think I'm a pacifist, just take a swing at me, right? I believe in self-defense and will defend myself and my sisters and brothers and my comrades and people I love. You damn right I will. But I am, don't believe in using violence as a way to actually assert domination and power over, right? So militant does not mean violent. What militant means is what Gandhi meant by militant. Gandhi actually described his entire nonviolent movement as militant because he said we will disrupt the operation of this empire. Yeah. Martin Luther King Jr. was militant because they were willing to disrupt the operation, right? So all militant means really is that you are committed, that you're serious. If you want systemic change and you only want to do it on the weekends when there's nothing good on television, you're wasting your effort, right? This movement has got to be serious and has got to be committed. So a social movement that is broad and deep and educated and militant. And the second thing, there must be an independent electoral expression of that movement. Because I believe that Malcolm X was right. If you want revolution, there's two things. The ballot or the bullet. The bullet. And I don't believe in using the bullet because I'm a nonviolent revolutionary. So I submit this. If you want systemic change, we got to find a way to intelligently do transformational electoral politics, right? And it's possible because it's been done before. And by that, I challenge you to think about the abolition of slavery, women getting the right to vote, the creation of the Social Security Administration, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation laws, pure food and drug laws, ending child labor, the entire fabric of what we today consider the bare damn minimum for a just and compassionate society, that... That program, every one of those, were actually originally proposed by so-called third parties. Third parties that did their work when they were called naive and unrealistic. Third parties that did their work when they were called uh, un-American. Third parties who did their work when they were called spoilers. So we have got to learn to actually recognize that the ruling elite have bamboozled us. And I'm going to conclude with this. We're going to open it up for discussion. Here's my last, though, remark. 
I think that principled liberals have been lied to and sold out by the ruling elite of the Democratic Party, and the leadership of the Democratic Party are actually at the beck and call of corporations in Wall Street America. The rank and file progressive Democrats, though, probably would love to hear, maybe some are in this room for that matter, but here's a corollary. The principled conservative has been lied to and sold out by the ruling elite of the Republican Party who is actually at the beck and call of corporations in Wall Street America. See, the ruling elite have figured out how to game the system politically and economically, and they're using both political parties to confuse us. The strength that we're going to have is when we have honest conversation with one another and we find out that regardless of party labels, regardless of ideologies, that we're human beings who want a peaceful, just, democratic, sustainable, and liberated society. Peace. Thank you. Woo!